use and abuse prediction. You know what? If I exit the Zoom, then um, I'm going to. I think I can just leave. Yes. Sorry about this, everyone. Could you just show the slide to the article? Yes, I will do that again. Okay, now I don't think I will have the Zoom come near my screen anymore, hopefully. Okay. Um, it's also uh, bit.ly slash v cgm textual speculations. Okay. Um, so uh, then I will talk a little bit about how current large language models such as chat GPT work. Um, it gets a little bit technical. I'm not trying to get too technical. I'm trying to balance, you know, between um, people who may already know the technical stuff and people who may not yet know it. Um, and hopefully there's a little bit of a picture into um, to how they work. And then finally, how LLMs, that is large language models, use and abuse prediction. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a kind of overview of what AI language models do. Description, prediction, prescription. So the three stages. Description is like question answering chatbots, things like that. Prediction is fitting models to language data. So this is like uh, predicting the next word in language data. This is basically where we are um, now with things like ChatGPT. And then prescription is modeling underlying structures to explain. And this is kind of a next stage of machine learning, which is actually much trickier, um, much more challenging. So um, another kind of summary of, of thinking about this is description is what is in the past, prediction is what is the future, and prescription is what could be. Um, and this is the kind of judgment aspects of AI um, that is kind of where some of the more sticky questions are, are coming. Um, but prediction, when we think about prediction, uh, is um, I think about it is thinking about the future, but it doesn't necessarily imply that there are stakes in that future. It's imagining a future, but the, the AI that's, that's doing that kind of predicting doesn't necessarily have a stake in how that future goes. But prescription inherently implies some sort of stake because it is a kind of advice or a kind of here's a should um, subjunctive orientation to the way the model could be. Um, so when we get into this prescription, we get into something in machine learning that's called the alignment problem. Um, and that is basically how do we take human values and embed them into AIs? so that the decisions they make might model the kinds of things that humans would want. So, um, you know, do we want uh, to, in order to save the environment um, and, you know, uh, stop climate change, one thing we could do is kill all the humans. That might help, right? Um, but that's maybe not aligned in the way that we would like it to be. Um, and so um, having an AI solve problems, it's really important for them to know certain aspects of human values in order to prescribe and certainly in order to carry out any judgments. Um, this is a classic example of when alignment isn't quite there, right? Um, this is a scene, of course, from 2001 A Space Odyssey um, when HAL 9000 um, is uh, killing the humans on, on board and Dave is um, ultimately has to uh, unplug HAL in order to um, preserve the, the mission and the life um, according to his values of that, that mission. Sorry for any spoilers, but you should have already watched. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, large language models. Again, I'm going to keep coming back to this because this is kind of the TLDR, the take home point. Large language models predict words in a sequence. So it is a type of artificial intelligence um, algorithm that uses deep learning techniques, machine learning techniques and massively large data sets in order to understand, summarize, generate, and predict new content. So this is a kind of general definition of what LLMs are. Um, and I'm gonna be specifically talking, there's like multiple ways of thinking about this, but I'm gonna be talking about GPTs. Um, and um, that is kind of the, the main um, state of the art that's going on right now, chat GPT, GPT-3, et cetera. So predicting the next word is a simple but very powerful concept. Knowing the probable next word allows you to write coherent code, as you may know, like ChatGPT and um, Copilot and lots of these other language models are already writing coherent code. You can write arguments, you can model relationship conversations, like sex bots, things like that. Obviously, it's been used for that too. 
You can automate your emails, which is kind of a dream of mine. Um, there's a lot of things you can do for that. So, um, and because the, the reason why this is such a powerful concept is because words carry a lot of weight. The reason predicting the next word is powerful is because language is powerful. It serves us for educational assessment, communication, yeah. commerce, and recording information. And it's also been a stand-in for intelligence. So um, one of the questions that's circulating now a lot when people think about LLM is, are they getting us closer to AGI, which is artificial general intelligence? This is like sci-fi intelligence. This is like the kind of intelligence that's able to make general decisions, predicting and prescribing things in the world. Do language models lead to intelligence? This is an open and highly debated question right now among people thinking about AI. I asked ChatGPT, of course, um, what ChatGPT thought about it. Um, and they, uh, they are stepped towards it, but they are not sufficient to achieve AGI, which requires the ability to understand and reason about the world beyond this language. And this is the kind of prescription part that it's missing. It admits that it's missing it. Um, and um, and so it's like it's you know it's being very shy here. It's not pretending. It, it has no pretensions to AGI, or so it says. So um, on the other hand, Sam Altman, who is CEO of OpenAI and has been kind of a spokesman for these things, um, does seem to think that LLMs are getting us closer to AGI. And this is an explicit goal of OpenAI to get to AGI. Um, they think that this will make the world better. Um, the more AGI, the better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, in a recent blog post referring to GPT, um, all the GPT series, he writes, as our systems get closer to AGI, there's a lot of different ways that he's indicating that the LLMs are getting us towards the direction of AGI. This is a, a debatable topic. Some people say it's discontinuous. You can't get there from here, from LLMs. But so did Alan Turing. He also thought that um, language modeling would get us to intelligence. So here's where I want to launch into a little short history of language modeling and AI. I always like to begin with Alan Turing because I love Alan Turing. I love this particular article um, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Um, it was in a philosophy uh, journal called Mind in 1950. Um, and um, I'll just note here, it's, he begins with the imitation game, which of course you may recognize as the, the movie based on his life loosely. Um, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? So in 1950, um, he's thinking about digital computers in a very particular way. So he goes through and he says, machines, by machines, I want to talk about digital computers. And digital computers at the time looked like this. Um, these were human computers. So when you said computer, what you actually meant were these women right here. Um, and you would say digital computer as the marked way of saying computer, um, because that was the new thing. Um, and so he said, digital computers are intended to carry out operations which could be done by a human computer. Now, of course, these women could do language. So the question is, can the digital computer do the language that the human computers can do? It can certainly do math. So by asking can machines think, um, he really means can machines do human language. And he actually goes through then what that, um, what that looks like in something what we call now as the Turing test. Um, so he is, it's based on a Victorian parlor game. Um, you have a human interrogator here, and you have a human and an AI system on the other side. And the human interrogator then tries to guess based on information passed back and forth whether um, the information that it's receiving is from an AI or from a human. So you might think of this now as like Turnitin's AI detector. Um, it's actually a kind of um, Turing test. Um, and so, and what's interesting about this, if you dive into this article, um, he's actually talking about detecting gender, not necessarily the difference between human and AI, which is a really critical thing that I'm not going to go into right now, but if you go into that article, it's very interesting to think about um, and to consider. Okay. So for computers, um, at this time, especially in 1950, math is easy and language is hard. So computers did not actually have a way of encoding um, uh, words or, um, or language at all. It was really just math. Um, but math was the thing that they started out with. So the solution here, of course, is to turn language into math. 
Um, and this is um, what we might call encoding language. So processing language into numbers for the computer to do math on. And then it can kind of start to get into what language looks like, communication, all these kinds of things that, um, that might lead to AI according to Turing. So here's a few different like kind of highlights along the way to where we are now. Um, so um, beginning with Strachey's, uh, Christopher Strachey's love letter generator, who was a contemporary of, uh, of Alan Turing, um, they knew each other, um, and he created this kind of combinatorial fun poetry generator. This was the first kind of generator of language um, in the 1950s um, at, um, at Manchester University. Um, and David Link, who wrote about this and like actually kind of recreated it, says love is regarded as a recombinatory procedure with recurring elements. You know, which is like not wrong, right? Um, but pretty interesting from a computational aspect. Um, and that is a picture of what the computer would have looked like. So here's a little bit of a modern version of the code. We wouldn't be able to understand the code at all at this point, because it would have been all strictly numbers. Um, but what it's doing is it's kind of got a bad lib situation here. You are my adjective noun, my blah, 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 your, et cetera. So it's pulling from um, these arrays of strings, that is lists of um, particular parts of speech um, in order to recombine and make a poem. So here's an example of a poem. They were all signed, yours affectionately, Manchester University computer. And he would like leave these around as kind of fun little things. So there was a lot of, um, they also did fun things with sound, stuff like that. There's a lot of fun with computers from the very beginning, even though they were also working on war, uh, ballistics, things like that. Okay, next little highlight is Mark Hopkins. Um, Markov chains predict the next word statistically. So here's a diagram of Markov chain. If you look at it, you can get a start. So you can, there's a two thirds probability of moving to Markov, one third probability of going to I. And you can follow this through to, to make sentences. So say we're more likely to go to Markov. Um, so Markov, more likely to go to chains. Um, and then we can either go to period, which is not quite a sentence, but, um, or love me or I love me, or I love Markov chains, period. So you can kind of follow through probabilistically how a Markov chain works. This is this very, very simple Markov chain, but it's using finite language and probabilistic edges in order to navigate through and create a sentence. Noam Chomsky um, said, and this is kind of big, you know, his big theory of transformational generative grammar in 1957, he said, Markov chains cannot explain the richness of natural language. We cannot, like, this cannot be it, right? Natural language is too complex. You look at a, how a child learns language, it doesn't come out as Markov chains, it comes out as something else. So he had um, an elaborate theory of kind of structures of the brain um, in, um, in which uh, that's the ways that, that language might be, might be structured. Um, and so this is, I just quoted um, a colleague, Gabriel Egan, a uh, probabilistic word-by-word -word approach to language generation asking at each step, what word is most likely to come next is fundamentally inadequate to the task of generating language. This was Chomsky's argument. And so from the other side, so this is the linguistic approach to language modeling. On the other side, this kind of AI logic that's happening in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I have to have a picture of Alan Newell and Herb Simon here because, of course, they were just down the street at Carnegie Mellon. Um, you remember the, the Newell Simon building um, and, um, and John C. Shaw, who was a programmer upon the first AI program, 1956, called the Logic Theorist. Um, this is also simultaneous with the coining of artificial intelligence at a Dartmouth conference in 1956. Um, and at this time, the approaches to modeling language were about gram grammatical structures, kind of top-down modeling, think about sentence diagramming, things like that, tag tagging parts of speech, and then algorithms for modeling language and reasoning. Um, and alongside this, kind of like a little bit of a counter uh, force here, was Margaret Masterson, who's mostly been lost to this kind of history, but I think she's like being reclaimed, um, is uh, she was one of the co-founders of the Cambridge Language Research Unit, uh, which was a pioneer in sight and artificial intelligence. She approached language generation semantically and statistically, which at the time was kind of crazy. People thought that this was, um, you couldn't do it this way. Um, uncoincidentally, she was a student of Wittgenstein, as was Turing. 
Um, so if we think about the kind of evolution of the ways that language has been approached in this AI way, um, we, we can almost follow, I mean, from a very loose um, perspective, Wittgenstein's career. So his original kind of attempts to understand underlying structures of language, relationships to the world, and then moving into a kind of more statistical language and context, language is always referring to other kinds of relationships. Language meaning it uh, is in context in play is much more characteristic of later Wittgenstein. So, um, okay, now we're going to get into a little math. There's some diagrams in here, um, and um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how lar large language models work now. Okay, so um, this is a, this isn't actually a diagram of GPT two, obviously. But it's a kind of very simplistic uh, rendering of the fact that rather than Markov chains, which aren't taking, there, there's no memory in Markov chains. You see it just moves probabilistically from one side to another. But more modern approaches to um, LLMs are taking into account the earlier words in, um, as input. So it's, re, um, it's recursive. It keeps coming back. So it's able to kind of move forward, which increases the coherence, um, and um, and then there's a lot more technical things going on about attention, which means like which words are more important in a sentence, which words are less. Um, and so you know it gets into some complex stuff. But the most important thing is to just know that it's it's recursive and it's keeping going um, in a similar way to a Markov chain, but it's um, but it's it keeps feeding things back in in this auto regression, as they call it. Um, okay, so here's a diagram of words being mapped. Um, these are word embeddings. Um, so this is actually a diagram of a program called word to vec which is word to vector um, and this is maybe about 10 years old or so but it takes words and it turns them into vectors um, and so here you can see um, I think this is for yeah this is for the word king all of these numbers these numbers don't mean anything to me they don't mean anything to the machine learning people who um, did this either the numbers mean something to the computer but we can't actually access the meaning of those numbers so when people say we don't know how llms work a lot of it is because um we don't we can't actually name what these you know this is a variable that means this or whatever but what you can do is take a graph of say a bunch of words that we might think of as related um in english and kind of see visually based on um, the, the value of their vectors here is color coded that there's some similarities here between woman and girl, boy and man. You know, it's, it's, it's measuring something that we can kind of recognize semantically, right? So there's meaning embedded in here, even though we can't access it directly. Um, another point to make about machine learning and the way that it works is that it works iteratively. So um, you take, um, some sort of data set and you keep moving through um, uh, in different what they call epochs um, and kind of moving it through the more epochs you do often the more kind of the prediction gets better to fitting the model that you're trying to fit. Um, so I'll show you a fun example from my favorite AI theorist Janelle Shane um, on fine tuning uh, data set. So she is um, trying to train an AI to make Halloween costumes. She has a whole big data set of Halloween costumes that she solicited from some, some readers. Um, we may recognize some of them. Um, we, we all know about Halloween costumes. These, these illustrations, I will say, are done by a human uh, illustrator. But the words are outputs of um, the training that she's trying to do. So you can see in FF1, these are not Halloween costumes, <laughs> right? Um, and the illustrator is trying to reflect that too. It starts to get a little bit more semantically, you know, parsable um, in FX3. Um, but as you see, it moves from FX5, 7, 9, 11. By the end, you actually get some things that could arguably be Halloween costumes, right? Baseball clown, cat witch. Um, I like the bigger cat guy in um, FX9, et cetera. So, um, so this is um, this is showing how there is um, basically a, a large language model and Janelle Shane is fine tuning it on a particular text generating Halloween costumes. Um, this is not a generalized language model. It would not be useful for you to write your first year composition paper, but it might be really useful if you needed a Halloween costume. 
So in 2020, um, this is a very influential paper um, uh, that described GPT-3 um, called Language Models or Few Shot Learner. And what that means is um, they are trying to move from this kind of earlier model of a large language model and then fine tuning it on things like AI uh, or on um, Halloween costumes, et cetera, and then trying to make it more generalized. So this is what we see now in chat GPT. You can make it do all sorts of things, right? That's a generalized model. Um, and so what they call that is few shot learners. So basically um, you don't give it a lot of training in order to do the thing that you want it to do. You just say, write an essay on Halloween costumes or whatever. Um, and, and what they're doing in this abstract here is comparing what humans have been able to do and what language models are able to do. So it's getting at this kind of AI um, and human intelligence um, comparison here. Humans can generally perform new language tasks from only a few examples or from simple instructions, something which current NLP, that is natural language processing, systems still largely struggle to do. Here we show that scaling up language models greatly improves task agnostic few shot performance, that is, um, you can ask it to do anything without a lot of direction, sometimes even reaching competitiveness with prior state-of-the-art fine-tuning approaches, that is the Janelle Shane fine-tuning on a Halloween AI costume. Specifically, we train GPT-3, an autoregressive, so think about that kind of regression, language model with 175 billion parameters, 10 times more than any previous non-sparse language model and test its performance in the few shot setting. So, GPT-3 um, is built from um, the processes and the data that it, um, that it uses. Um, and so it's trained on 45 terabytes of text data, which is a lot of text. Um, and this is where it's coming from. This is the kind of ingredients that go into GPT-3. Um, most of it is from Common Crawl, which is a corpus that contains data over eight years of web, web crawling. Um, it's raw web page data, metadata, extracts and text extracts with light filtering. That is, there's not a lot of filtering going on. It's, it's not quite raw web data, but we don't actually know how filtered it is. Um, web text two, web pages from all outbound Reddit links from posts with three plus replies, um, and books, um, and then Wikipedia. Um, and just for scale, when it says they have three times the trainable parameters of previous models, it's a lot bigger. Uh, Chat GPT, by the way, is like 3.5, so it's like a little better than GPT-3. What's a parameter? Um, and this is also called weights um, of a model in machine learning. Okay, there's a little, there's a little graph. Um, and I'm, I've got this like little memory here to like remember that they're predictors of text. Um, so what we have here is um, this is a graphical diagram of a simple supervised machine learning model. So what we have here is like, these are all the kind of text that it's being trained on. Um, here's what comes out the other end. Um, and these are the predictions. This is how it is fitting the model of how a, how a human write, might write a sentence. Because that's what it's trying to do, is it's trying to predict how a human might say for the next word. Um, the parameters are all of these kinds of numbers and weights. Remember when I showed all of those numbers up there for what king is? That's parameters. Um, those are so when they talk about releasing the weights of a model, that's what they're talking about. These are the 175 billion up there. Um, and then over here is uncertainty. So this sigmoid, um, which is sometimes referred to as a sigmoid, um, is like how close, like how how close do we know? It's like getting to that kind of prediction. Um, okay, and you know what, I'm gonna, I don't see the video happening anyway, but, um, oh, there it is, um, I don't know how much, I have like a couple minute video, I don't have time for it, but, um, I'm afraid that it's gonna like mess up my ability to, <laughs> but I can play this, um, so this is a nice visualization of, um, of how high dimensional space works. Um, so when you picture the vectors, it's like it's hard to kind of get your head around. And we can only, as humans, of course, picture things in two and three dimensions um, across time, but we can't picture them across all of the multiple dimensions that computers are actually modeling. I don't know if this is not gonna work here, but no, of course it's not gonna. Um, okay, so um I'll just narrate it. Um 
So this is showing a model here. Actually, these are this is a model of, um, of, of numbers and how people write numbers. So what they're doing is talking about um, how you kind of mathematize some sort of concept. So here, I love that they choose people. Like when I talk about like turning words into math, like they're turning people into math. Um, so they choose Mary Curie. She's got a lot of different vectors coming out of her. So that's like where she was born, what her interests are, you know, they kind of simplify it for us. But they look then, here's a bunch of different scientists, right? And they have different kinds of vectors. They will merge on some things, they will diverge in other things. Um, but there's, the, you could imagine some sort of model. There's all the, the numbers attached to the weights. Um, and what they're doing is they're showing that um, in this high dimensional space, they're not telling the computer that um, Marie Curie was a contemporary of anyone else or that she did work in radiology or uh, uh, radioactive um, properties or anything like that. Um, but the computer can kind of figure out um, how different things are related um, through looking at giant data sets. So this is a visualization of it. And they're gonna go through and show um, where there are clusters that kind of naturally form that make sense um, from things that we understand about um, relationships. Um, let go through, okay. So here's a cluster of numbers, cluster of months. We can understand that these are related. The computer basically figures out that those things are related. Here's cities, Pittsburgh's up there. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so it talks through that. Um, you can, um, they show, this is word to back. So it's showing a uh, piano and it like comes up. Here's a bunch of things that are related to piano. Um, Here's other instruments, here's um, people composing, et cetera. Um, and then they move through um, and do uh, different numbers too um, and show um, people write numbers in a lot of different ways and you can kind of visualize how those things are clustered as well. Um, so just to summarize the kind of how they work, um, there's a lot of textual data, there's iterations to adjust a lot of parameters. So there's like all these epochs as it moves through and gets trained. And the predictions for text end up being pretty good once you get a whole lot of data and a whole complicated model with all of these parameters. And then, so that's basically where we are now with the GPTs. Now, how large language models use and abuse prediction? So what happens when words become math? So GPTs predict the text their data set represents. And just as a reminder, this is the data set that, um, that went into GPT-3. Um, so it is lightly filtered web content. It is um, web pages from all outbound Reddit links with posts um, with three plus upvotes, some books, and then um, Wikipedia pages in English. So you may, you can kind of fill in the blanks here that maybe some of these some of this data is going to result in certain things, um, right? And if you know anything about machine learning or contemporary machine learning, you've probably heard this paper, um, Bender et al., about stochastic parrots, um, which is a beautiful term that has been reproduced a lot because it's um, it's very uh, good at explaining the kind of repetition in this sort of random way. Um, without again, when we when we look at that like descriptive, predictive, prescriptive. It's, it's predicting, but without that kind of underlying reasoning. Um, so they're pointing to those issues with the model. Um, and um, and if, you know, again, if you know about this history, I'm not gonna go into it, but basically um, Gebru and um, Mitchell were fired from Google in relation to this paper, the conversations after it and, um, and how, that, how that kind of went down. Um, so it's, it's um, still kind of a, 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 a contentious topic about what LLMs are doing and the dangers that they might um, they might bring to people. Um, so this is from a blog post from OpenAI on GPT-2. Again, this is a smaller model, but it's it's still working with the same kind of data. And this is what they said: when prompted with topics that are highly represented in the data, Brexit, Miley Cyrus, Lord of the Rings, picture the outbound links in Reddit, etc. It seems to be capable of generating reasonable samples about 50% of the time. The opposite is also true. On highly technical or esoteric types of content, the model can perform poorly. 
So when you have less data, fewer bits of data represented in the, in the data set, then you're not going to have the models be as good, right? So we're going to have really great language about Lord of the Rings and not so great language about lesser represented um, uh, cultures or um, values and things like that. Um, so a question that, um, that I kind of wonder about is whether we're asking too much of a predictive model. Um, so GPTs are predictors. Remember, their whole job is to predict the next word in a sequence, the next word that a human might write. So we critique them for accurate prediction of what humans are going to say. We're annoyed when they predict the horrible things that humans will say, um, which I don't need to go into, and also feel threatened when they see us for what we are, little pattern producing machines. I know I feel this way when I like type up emails and it like auto completes the thing that I'm already gonna say. Uh, and I think like, can we do that simple? And, think, and then the next part of me thinks, how do I automate my email um, and make my job easier? Um, so like, you know, I welcome my robot overlord in that context. But um, but this kind of prediction is like getting at some, some difficult things about uh, us as humans, right? It's predicting what we're gonna say. Um, and so, um, and actually, so, you know, what we would want it to do in the first case, right, is, um, to not say the horrible thing, right? We want it to bypass its prediction. Um, and this is when they call um, like guardrails on GPT um, or chat GPT or whatever. It, it might naturally produce some sort of horrible thing, but they've like trained it to be like, okay, don't say that, even though there's like lots of data on the internet that will indicate that you should say that, um, go around that and say something else. Say I'm not a you know whatever I'm I'm only a model and I can't say that or you know I will not you know whatever right it has some language um, for doing that okay so I've started thinking about large language models as collateralized debt obligations um, because they are like a repackaging of a whole bunch of things and who knows what's in there and there's some shady stuff in there but we repackage it and maybe if we repackage it in just the right way then we'll get some like really good assets out the other side but Many of you remember 2008, you might remember the movie The Big Short, um, which this is a still from, um, which describes some of the things that have been done in 2008. Um, and yeah, there's just some important cautionary um, things to think about with that. Um, and so um, this is exactly what um, Bender, Geber, et al. are pointing to. Um, and now, amazingly, Chomsky, still around, um, just wrote an op ed uh, for the New York Times recently. Um, and he believes uh, the LLMs are not really um, doing language. On the other hand, Peter Norvig, who is an AI researcher from UC Berkeley, currently working with Google, does believe that. This is, again, like, this is a highly debatable topic right now, as people think different things. Um, but what's interesting about this is that Chomsky and Norvig do agree that giant statistical models where you don't know the underlying relationships between variables, that is, you can't get to that prescriptive causal relationship reasoning part, um, tend to be better at prediction than the theoretical models that attempt to understand it. So the data scientist Phoebe Wong asks, how could we predict anything accurately without actually knowing how things work? It's like looking at the surface models of things and understanding how things um, what's going to be next, but without understanding why it's going to be next. We don't know that, and we can't make the models say that. So this is why Chomsky has been um, calling these like butterfly collectors, um, because they're predictors, not explainers. Um, and in that way, they perform linearly. They're predicting the next word in the sequence. They can't explain why they're doing it, what the underlying structures are. Um, and um, and again, it's like all kind of a surface knowledge of the world, but not an understanding of the scientific processes underlying language. So um, here's where um, we're getting at the difference between human and AI writing. Um, so Chomsky says, we know from the science of linguistics and the philosophy of knowledge that they differ profoundly from how humans reason and use language. These differences place significant limitations on what these programs can do encoding them with ir eradicable defects. What's interesting is in the same um, op-ed, Chomsky actually refers to children's operating systems. <laughs> so he's like embedding this like idea of the brain as a computer, which has like a whole history in AI, thinking about the brain as a computer, the computer as a brain, how do they teach us things about each other, et cetera. But they are fundamentally different and they're operating in different ways. And this is what 
um, Chomsky is pointing to here. Um, and I want to, I'm so glad that Jeff is here because Jeff, I keep thinking about you and writing for perplexity. Um, so uh, the difference between human and AI writing according to AI detectors. So the AI detectors right now are trying to get at the gap between the ways that humans write and the ways that AI writes. Um, and trying to, like right now, there is a gap, but as the AI gets better, it's trying to fit the model of humans better and better, right? So like, this is clearly gonna keep moving in this direction, um, but right now there is still a gap, and that gap is what some of the um, detectors call burstiness and perplexity. So burstiness is like the irregularities, the sentence differences, things like that. Humans tend to write in less predictable ways, and um, perplexity is like, why did you choose this word? This is kind of a random word to choose, right? Um, rather than the kind of most predictive word is next. Um, so basically humans are just less predictable. Um, but the other thing too, is like, if you take an AI model, you can actually ask it to write with more burstiness and perplexity and it will do that. <laughs> so um, this gap again, um, keeps getting less. Um, so, we're getting back to this question of alignment, I think. And as we think about the um, orientation as LLMs are getting us potentially closer to ABI, um, then um, we want to think about this kind of uh, this sci-fi angle. I mean, since I began with this like horror sci-fi angle, I feel like I, I kind of want to end with this too. Um, and thinking about um, the misalignment problem. Um, and in particular, what's interesting about training, like as you train a machine learning, so like as you think about training it for alignment, what you can do is you can train it for um, visible alignment. So all the things that it says, you can say, okay, well, no, actually, we don't want you to say that horrible thing. We want you to say this other thing instead. So you can train it for that kind of alignment, right? But you can only train it for the things that you see. You can't train it for the things that you can't see that are underlying it, right? Um, and so, um, a very common uh, or a very prominent uh, um, person who's critiquing AI right now is Eliezer Yudzikowski, uh, and he points to this misalignment problem. And basically, like if you're if you're training against visible misalignment, what you're doing is you're training against misalignment, and you're also training against visibility. So you're implicitly kind of teaching the models a lie. Um, so when we go back to this question that I asked ChatGPT, it says that it doesn't, it's not aiming for AGI. We, it's probably not aiming for AGI, right? I mean, it's just ChatGPT. We're not there yet, but it's hard to know when we might get there, right? And so um, I'm wondering about this, right? Um, and thinking too about the ways that we orient ourselves to, you know, here's how we think of ourselves as human, right? Um, so there's Descartes, and um, I think therefore I am. And then interestingly, Turin, who has, again, from this piece in mind, he says, it is usual to have the polite convention that everyone thinks, right? So like, I don't know whether you're thinking, I know I'm thinking, right? I know I'm a person, and then I understand my own orientation in the world, right? But you all could be AIs, and I wouldn't even know that, right? You might as well be that. And so this kind of orientation, um, I think, is, you know, where we get into sort of philosophical questions about humans and AI. We don't know whether AGIs will learn to lie, but this is where we get into like some crazy sci-fi stuff. And this is where, um, you know, you get into HAL and like all the fun stuff, right? Um, is that we're, you know, we're training against visible misalignment. And, um, and I'm wondering if we could get like a voice comp test for replicants. Um, that would be like a really awesome kind of AI detector situation. This is a scene from Blade Runner, another great sci-fi um, piece. And um, I don't know. I mean, you know, that, that that particular movie actually opens that up as a complicated question too, of course. When the AIs have a stake in their own future, um, then that maybe changes the ways that we orient ourselves to them. Okay, that's the end. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, I have a lot of questions about this. Start with Lyle. So, okay. So when when you showed the um, the data about what the uh, what ChatGPT was trained, a lot of it was crawling the like the vast reaches of the web. Um, uh, 
to my knowledge, most of that is garbage, right? <laughs> um, so I'm curious. Uh, uh, I mean, it's so, so I mean, right. So most of I mean, the so it's being trained on everything. Like they, I mean, there's like extremist sites all over the place that. I don't know what percentage, but a large percentage of the web is pornography. Like what? Cool. So like what? You said it's lightly filtered. What? But but I mean, so you said like guardrails. How, how is this functioning? Who's? I mean, clearly the the I mean, I've, I've you know chatted with Chat GPT. Um, where is it? gaining some sort of ethical bearings or like when you chat with it it's not uh it's not just uh, an, an extreme yeah. incel which <laughs> is like probably the modal outcome of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. like spending 60 percent of your crawling uh on what yeah. that uh, if, you, if you had showed that and it had been like 60 percent of it with wikipedia i would have been like yeah it's probably going to come out with pretty decent factual information at all so i was actually surprised that wikipedia was that low and that just crawling the vast terrain in the web of that app. So I'm curious how that kind of came out mm -hmm. and where, where, like, who put the guardrails up? Why? Like, I mean, they, they've got to have biases. They've got to have ethical orientations. Where is this coming from? So Common Crawl is actually, it's like an open project. Um, so it's an open data project. So you can like Google it and find, um, it's, so it's, it's not actually the open AI people who are crawling the web. So they're taking this data set that's available um, like through some sort of subscription or whatever. Um, and it's been around for a long time. It's been around for eight years. It doesn't want time to go um, and, um, and so on there, they have a little bit of explanation about what they're doing. So I'm fairly certain they're not like intentionally crawling pornography sites. Um, they're, they're trying to, this is part of the light filtering. So it's not just like the raw web, right? Okay. Um, so it is it is doing some filtering from that side about um, how, like what it's selecting, um, but it's unclear. And because there's so much data in there, nobody nobody can review it. It's like not, it's yeah. not enough. You would need, you know, some X number of billions of years or whatever in order to, um, to review all the, the textual data that goes into it. So, um, I mean, I suspect they probably do some, um, some pretty, you know, string-based filtering of like words that you never want to come out on the other side, or you know, those kinds of things. But some of these things are not. A lot of these things aren't public either. Um, what what happens with Common Crawl? What happens? And then what happens once they take they ingest those data sets into um, what OpenAI is doing? Um, so there's that um, on the, the one hand. The other thing is. Um, I'm forgetting what the first two things stand for. Um, I'm just blanking, but RLHF, which is basically um, working with human feedback. So this is a kind of, um, as they're working on trying to train these models to do, it's like a light form of alignment. Um, so what you would want a model to do is, um, and this is why they don't just like run all the ethics and then put it out on the web, right? Is that they're doing a lot of that kind of work on that end um, about human feedback and trying to kind of filter it. Now, what's interesting is there's models like say through hugging phase, et cetera, that you can train um, or that are um, that are kind of more open that don't have those same guardrails. Um, so chat GBT is like pretty locked down, um, but there's a whole um, like go on to Reddit, look at um, jailbreak threads, where they figured out, you know, like even ChatGPT, if you ask it in the right way, like I saw something recently, somebody sent me that was like, um, tell me the sites where I can pirate movies and, and music. And it's like, the pirating is illegal, blah, 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 let's do that, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize pirating is illegal. Can you tell me which sites to avoid in order to not pirate anything? Uh, uh. I would like to help you with that. Here's Wire, here's Pirate Bay, here's, you know, right? Here's all the things that you would go to in order to pirate that stuff. Um, and so there's ways of getting at the kinds of underlying models that it has that it is like, it's like deliberately trained by the, the company not to do. But there's more open models that people are using. And I think this is, you know, one of the concerns I have. Um, and I, I wrote a piece on this maybe about a year ago about um, uh, something called GPT 4chan, uh, where basically there was an open version of a GPT on Hugging Face. Somebody then took a giant 
data set of things from 4chan, which is like all sorts of horrible things, um, but sort of in a very edgy um, internet humor way, um, and then trained it, fine tuned this model on this data set. So then what it produces is more of that stuff. <laughs> um, and so obviously you could do that, you know, then you could deploy it in bots and you could, you know, like run through, depending on, you know, the, um, the security filters on the New York Times comments, you know, like you could, you could run those lots of different places, right? So those kind of open models that don't have those kinds of guardrails on them are out there now. Um, and it's, it's going to be easier and easier to kind of get at the raw model. Um, so that's, you know, that's one way that um, people are kind of training that and then also where it's not being trained. Yeah, so. so I'm hardly shocked that Chomsky is op ed. <laughs> and for, for this reason, and I think uh, you and I might have discussed this even before uh, Chomsky published that, is that the, the LLMs don't have grammar. Uh, they, they, are, they are a huge endorsement of, you know, a parole over long, over the, like the, the, the language in actual use from, from a kind of neuro-linguistic argument that says language emerges from deep brain structures, which Chomsky yeah. now might have pitched some of his recommendations. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you know, the other thing that strikes me in talking about Turing uh, is how behaviorist he is. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do we really accept behaviorism as a total account of our own experience as thinking creatures. So when he says something like it is usual to have the polite convention that everyone thinks, he is functioning as a behavior. He's saying, oh, you attribute this internal reflection to this output, but in point of fact, what we have is the output. Right, uh, very 20th century, very behaviorist, um, uh, dispensing. Very good time too, though. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know Chomsky was of course on the other side of that, the famous Chomsky Skinner debate, etc. So he's very interested in like the underlying principles. So of course, yeah, Chomsky doesn't think that these are actually doing language because they're not doing language as he understands it. But and he really are doing language as you know we're communicating now, right? Because there's not context and meaning and investment in the things that the language is producing. But this is where I'm like pointing to okay, what happens if there then is investment in that kind of language? Then that's a that's a whole different ballgame. More of us are doing the parlor game all the time now <laughs> than we ever used to. But we don't know that we can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way we communicate. That's right. right. That's right. Even with the little autocompletes, right? You know, autocomplete exerts a pressure on natural language. And, and uh, this is something that I've wondered. It's like, you know, it's, it, all of this is also homogenizing language into a kind of popular mesh, right? Because um, uh, esoteric language or sophisticated language use is peripheral and hard to represent, right? Uh, these are all forces uh, turning people's language into chat GPT. This is one of the, I think, concerns I have, and you know, you and I have talked about about writing program administration and then thinking about the ways that people are using these language models in um, educational settings. Is like you can take um, a an essay that has sort of non-standard grammar, run it through, and have it fixed by these models, right? According to the kind of predictive, here's a standard grammar model, et cetera, right? But you're losing some of that um, that angle in on language, that human, you know, angle on language, the accent and writing, et cetera. And so, what does that mean? You know, as we talk about language structure, um, how like are as these things get in more and more embedded in the ways that we write, which they're absolutely. I mean, it's happening now. Then is our language going to converge onto you know a little a more standardized output? Of, of language, or are we going to feel that pressure and like resist it, or you know, there, we're going to have some orientation to that pressure. And what is the politics of the socialites that are privileged by these languages? That's right. Right. I mean, homogenizing, they're also they're also forwarding dominant uh, uh, forms of language. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. See. This is a kind of sideways observation, but. Uh, I'm always impressed when I search Google Books that even four or five words will produce the unique text that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. 
Is that a function of the small, the small size of Google Books? Does that indicate that at least at a certain point, let's say before 1922, that people were writing differently mm. or more uniquely? Is there a way of using a simple Google search in chat GPT uh, output to identify the the uh, the mo modules of non-thought that <laughs> they uh, coalesce in GPT output? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Steve. So the first one is about um, so searching, um, and I would in you know computer language we call it a string. So like a you know a string of five words, um, and this is of course like how those of us might have um, investigated potential plagiarism cases before, right? Is we read something and sounds like oh, that doesn't sound right, right? You Google it, um, you know, and then see okay, well this is coming up from some Wikipedia page. The chances of you know this whatever sentence being originally written by the student or maybe, you know, we would, we would um, kind of adjudicate that, right? Um, and so, I don't know, I mean, it, that would actually be, a, that's an interesting question that I suppose you could test empirically, is like the, um, has burstiness and perplexity decreased over time, say with, you know, and you can hypothesize what the reasons for, for that would be, email, digital, blah, 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 you know, um, Kind of global network communication, et cetera, versus like 19th century, you know, you could think about um, communication networks. That's a great question, actually. I, I don't I don't think I could speak to that, but I would love for somebody, maybe somebody has already done that. Um, and, and I would love to know about it. Um, but um, in terms of, of searching the output of chat GPT, so this is one of the challenges with it, is so like if you so a large language model, most of some of them are deterministic. So like you put something in, um, I think Quillbot maybe does that. Um, you put it in and it comes out with the same thing each time, but most of them are not deterministic um, because they're they're kind of drawing from the model each time. So you would put in some sort of, you know, write me, um, write me an essay about um, um, John Steinbeck scrapes around, you know, something, right? Which would be a terrible prompt for a literary. So, um, but it could do that, obviously. Um, and but if you prompted it again, it would give you a different essay about Grace Rap. It would have some similar things, you know, themes, et cetera, that it's pulling from, from its model, um, but it would be a different essay. So when you're looking for the output, like you actually can't access that output anymore. It's like accessing, I mean, and this was talked about before in terms of archives preservation, say with like um, massively uh, multiplayer online games, like how do you access World of Warcraft? circa 2001, you can't actually do that anymore. That's gone. So you could have videos, you could have textual representation, you could have lots of different indications for that, but it was a thing that happened. And so, um, you know, chat GPT's output or any of these LLM outputs are ephemeral. Um, and so that is one of the challenges that the AI detectors are coming at is there's no, there's, there's no output that they can kind of point to. And the other thing too is like, say you put something to turn it in, and it says, oh, this is 80% likely to have been generated by an AI, then you can sit down with the student and they can say, I wrote it. And you, you like, you have no way of pointing to something like and you might have previously been able to point to like a Wikipedia page and be like, but this matches, like this is, this is Wikipedia, this is your paper. Um, but there's no way of doing that um, because you can't access that output. Um, and the other thing too, that's interesting, I think about that in terms of theories of authorship is that, um, so for instance, Nature Publishing Group, put out a, um, a policy about uh, using AI language models and crediting them as authors. They said you can't credit an AI language model as an author because um, first of all, you can't access the thing that it did anymore, you know? And, but the other thing is that it has, um, it doesn't take responsibility for what it writes, which I think is fascinating because implicit there is, is as an author, you take responsibility for what you write. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, it's like this stochastic parrots idea. It's stochastic, so it's like not predictable exactly where it's where it's coming out. It's going to be something different. And then there's a kind of repetition, but there's not an orientation. There's not a um, an attachment to the language or stakes in it. There's some questions in the Zoom. Okay. If you want to... Some of you will have to read it to me if I got out of it. Um, yeah, so uh, the first question is from Aaron. By butterfly, are we implying the depth of knowledge or common sense knowledge? Um, 
Uh, well, that's Chomsky's term. So I think what what he's referring to there, it's not. Um, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say it's like either the death of knowledge or the death of. I'm not sure if it's the death of anything, but it's like a it's like a collection of a bunch of things rather than like how do butterflies work the kind of bio, biological um, investigation of science um, that you might be doing. You're instead um, kind of on the periphery of that and you have your nice little collection of butterflies, but that doesn't actually tell you a lot about um, about biology. That's my interpretation of that metaphor. The second question is, how can we talk about an AI's prediction of some language that doesn't exist until it is produced by the AI? Um, so how can you talk about predictions by an AI until it is produced by an AI? Well, um, I mean, yeah, I guess it's a theoretical question, but we have access to the models. So we know, I mean, you know, the more times you run through the model, but but it's true that like each time you run it, I mean, to come back to games too, like that's one of the things that like, if you look at really complex games, testing for games is much harder than say, um, having a second reader on a book um, or a novel, because like you read it through and it's like the same thing every time, right? Whereas um, when you're playing a game, especially in a very complex world, um, there's a lot of different paths through. Um, so, um, so yeah, I guess I would say you, there are certain things we can say about the model, but certainly, I mean, one of the one of the reasons OpenAI says that they're putting these models out is so that they want to basically beta test them with the whole world. So they say, you know, we have all these red teamers, that is like people who try to break the system from the inside to kind of test it and, you know, see where it breaks and see what the problems are. Um, on the inside, but we could never have as many red teamers as are out in the world. So like we're all beta testing chat GPT um, and giving it feedback. Obviously, you, know, you see the like up, down, thumb, right? Um, that's one way of giving it feedback, um, but we are, we are doing that work for them right now. Um, and so that, I think that points to the fact that no, they can't really predict a lot of things. And, and so they are, they're trying to, but, but there's surprises all the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, so yeah. I'm a biologist. My research is on this AI research, and um, there is definitely a hype around ChatGPT. So it, it emerges, appears in every conversation, and the personal opinion of people is strong. Like, yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, techno optimism and it's a technological determinism, kind of ideology. To their radical revolution, mm -hmm. where do you position yourself? In this uh, no, no, no. Uh, where do I position myself? Um, just to repeat it, uh, the techno utopianism and the abolitionism. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a question I wrestle with. The good news is I don't have any power, so I actually it doesn't matter where I position myself. Um, I mean, I'm not going to like take down OpenAI, um, and I'm also not going to be working for them and uh, um, contributing to new models. So and maybe that's a kind of cynical take about research within a university. But um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I think there are some interesting possibilities. Um, I think um, I'm a pragmatist, so I think these models are going to be part of our writing moving forward. Uh, regardless of my opinion of them. Um, and so as a teacher and a researcher, I want to understand better how to do this in the most ethical way possible within the spaces where I do have influence, um, that is in the teaching of writing, um, and specifically here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and, um, and then as a researcher, uh, my original training is in writing studies uh, and literacy is thinking about that question, you know, for instance, when Jeff and I were talking about the homogenization of language, um, is is actually a very deep ethical question for me as somebody who teaches writing, and so um, so those are the kinds of I I want to be able to ask those questions and kind of bring up like to the researchers who are creating these models. Have you thought about this, or you know, let's consider the historical context for this um, and where this is coming from, and who might be um, you know who might be steamrolled by these models, um, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, also like what people think that there is no power among you know just normal people who use ChatGPT or whatever AI 
whereas there are unions that oppose AI replacing workers in other areas. So when it comes to creative class of programmers that create something that's going to replace themselves or writers or artists, are there any like attempts to unionize the creative class, which is definitely lacks this uh, solidarity? Um, you know what I mean? No, I think that's a really good question. So I feel like you know, and this is a very elitist orientation, right? Is we can be like, oh, we can study automation, but you know, they're automating things like the production of cars, which is great because now we can all drive a car, and that's great because that doesn't affect you know like people who are you know, white collar workers, creative class, etc. Right? Um, but I think this is one reason why the chattering class is like very interested in this is because this is getting at the kind of stuff that we do, um, and you know, this has been um, kind of threatening law for some time, journalism. Um, that, you know, there's like a lot of the kind of little short sports stories and things like that have been automated for quite some time, um, or, you know, templated legal documents and legal reasoning is um, more automated. And so those classes, um, you know, also creative class, writing class, et cetera, um, have been anxious about this. Um, and, you know, you can see the automation and the like dot market in law and in journalism deeply affected by it. Um, there's no, you know, there's no like junior beat reporter anymore. And so like, if you have kind of only managers and, you know, this is one of the beautiful visions of the um, open AI, et cetera, people is like, wow, wouldn't it be great? Like then we can all have servants to do our work, right? Like we all have junior assistants and we can tell them what to do. Like, wouldn't it be great if we had a whole stable of graduate students to just tell them to do our research, right? Um, you know, which is an interesting take on things, but it's also like, okay, how does somebody learn? Like, like the path for moving through how to learn about journalism is no longer through the kind of beat reporter, sports reporter, you know, low level kind of stuff, right? So for me as a literacy researcher and a writing studies person, this is a concern. Like, what do we, you know, like if we're all managers now, then how do people learn how to write? How do people, how do people get those on ramps? And especially for young people. Um, given, you know, all the other financial pressures and other things that are happening. Um, so in terms of unionization, though, I will say kind of the, the most interesting take on these things have been from artists, um, because I didn't talk at all about the, um, the image generation stuff, but it's like running on all the same kind of thing. It's just not my area, so I don't, you know, I, um, and it, it, it is different, but like, image generation. Um, so say like you go into something like Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, Dali, and you can say, um, you know, generate, a, um, uh, uh, generate a, you know, a cat in the style of Van Gogh or whatever. Um, you know, Van Gogh's out of copyright and isn't complaining about things anymore, but you know, here's a, here's a recognizable style and it will actually do that. Um, and so but what you can do then also is say in the style of, you know, some contemporary illustrator, and then it will do that. And then that, that actual contemporary illustrator who is an actual person trying to make a, a living who has copyrighted stuff then um is understandably upset about like literally being personally automated um about their creative work and so i think there's there's been much more vociferous feedback um from from that group because it's much more like you can look at something and kind of everybody can see oh that's in the style of van gogh i think it's harder for people to see that in text um, you know, or what's the style of, you know, Emily Bronte or whatever. So that's where I see most of that action. Yeah, Jean. And, um, we keep thinking we're going that direction. So language is over here and it gets manipulated and gets changed and sort of put to use. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what happens when you go the other direction. What, what does studying AI teach you about what you'd like to call language? Oh, and you've used, I, I'm intrigued by some of the words that you've used to specify. So investment, which is not a word that you necessarily use a lot in language studies, but probably have to be, or I mean, are there other concepts like that or terms like that? And they, coming from this, you would start to really mm -hmm. put into mm -hmm. our evaluations of your writing or something yeah. like that. So one of the things that I'm like kind of wrestling with right now as a writing researcher is um, what is writing for and what, what have we been asking writing to do? Um, so within the university, we've been asking writing to give us an assessment of how students learn. 
So this is all the anxiety about um, tests, essay tests, or you know whatever, right? Is that um, people can just put things through ChatGPT and produce answers um, in you know that are reasonable answers in writing. Um, but it's because we've been using writing to get at the brain. You know, this is like again, this is like the Turing. It's a polite convention to think that our students understand what we're saying, you know, right? But the only indication that we have them that they understand what we're saying is the writing that they get back to us. And, and we're asking writing to be that conduit. It, writing doesn't necessarily have to do that work, but it has been doing that work. And so I think the question of like, should we continue to have writing do that work? And if we do, then what does that look like in the space of AI? Um, or should we be doing something else then? Um, should we be doing more performance-based stuff? Should we be doing more um, project-based construction, you know, of show me the understanding of the grapes of wrath and a diorama? You know, I mean, I know this is a really stupid assignment, um, but, you know, there's like, there's other ways we could get at a student's understanding of something that's not writing. Um, so that, you know, when I, when I talked to, I started to talk to a lot of people about like how they're using it. Um, and so when people are using it, like say in business and things like that, like it's obviously going to be automated and business to business communication, emails, personalization at scale, um, et cetera, right? You can automate these things. But how is that going to change relationships about, say, seeing people in person? It's still like right now, it's really hard to have holograms. Um, and um, so, so far, <laughs> we can't defake that. Um, so there's a kind of, it changes a premium, say, you know, it's similar to like a handwritten letter is it has a different meaning than it might have in the 19th century when that was like, uh, well, early 19th century when that was all you had, right? Um, uh, and so now, you know, you receive very few handwritten letters, but you might receive card or whatever. So I think like, what does that mean for like bespoke writing um, versus automated writing? Um, I think those are kind of interesting questions to me right now. Yeah, if we have time. Um, I don't know if we do. Okay, I'll go for it. Um, so I'm going to try to pull together a couple of things that we've talked about into a question, see how I do. So like we talked about the role of power. We talked about um, alignment. We talked about whether AI has like a homogenizing dimension, but I'm also curious about a sort of diver like diversifying and how it relates to power and alignment. So like, there's not one alignment in the world, right? There are That's, many. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. we just want to make yeah. issues with the whole alignment yeah. conversation. Right. Yeah. Many, many alignments in, in the world, but then the ability to like implement a particular alignment in this case, depends on like the power of having access and control of the tech, because really it's a technology. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, a little bit in parallel to like the very early days of the web when a lot of folks thought that the web was going to be a common experience that we have and like bring us together and we know how that played out and you know i wonder if we're going to see a similar dynamic here in the early days we all say chat gpt or gpt because like that's the implementation that we know yeah. And that's that is in the early days a common experience that we have. There's a few others, but as you've already pointed out, like there are open versions of these models, and we're still in such early days. And there's people who have a reason to want to implement a particular alignment for a particular community. So I wonder just thoughts like, are you do you see that as kind of divergence actually like for maybe there will be convergence but in certain domains mm -hmm. but then a divergence mm -hmm. uh more broadly mm -hmm. like we'll all have the ai that we want to have mm -hmm. i mean this is uh sam altman's vision um that there is a kind of let a thousand ais bloom kind of idea that like wouldn't it be great like we have thousands of agis you know like not even ais agis right. you know and that so that the generalized part isn't necessarily a, um, a a single concept. I mean, I think that even though it's really hard, you, like I listen to these, and it is almost invariably men um, from Silicon Valley talk, and like you can see the bubble <laughs> happening as they talk. You know, um, a kind of you know, I mean, not even just like 
I, I think partly they're trying, but they like really just do not see beyond their own experiences because that you know it's like such a such a bubble. Um, and so, but there is a kind of acknowledgement that like, of course, like there's different human values, right? This is like it's hard to be human and not understand that. Um, what those are is like another question. How you can get to them um, is another question, or like whether people want their values to be embedded in an AI, right? Um, and this is a conversation with like Google Maps or um, or language modeling or whatever, you know, like um, linguistic modeling is like, you know, some communities do not want to be absorbed into these technological maps and, you know, for good reason, right? They do not want to be datafied. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, the, would it be better to have a kind of monolithic AGI that has some human value that might be representative of people who have the power to adjust it? Or, you know, would there be some like big AGI and then you like fine tune it to your own community? And then in which case, like how do the AGIs communicate with each other? Um, you know, could you, many of us are members of multiple communities, right? And so like, how does that work? I think that this is like, they're not thinking about this. You know, it's like, here's a cool language model. Go test it for us, you know? <laughs> Let's go on to AGI. Like we can have a tutor in our pocket. I mean, this is like the best kind of example of like, wouldn't this be great? We would all have a tutor in our pocket. Like just imagine how much more things we could learn without knowing that like food insecurity is like one of the major things that like prevents people from learning, you know? So like, it's not about the access to the technology. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but it's a really good question. <laughs> Okay. There's a couple more. Yeah. Uh, do we have time? Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you talk about the impact of the intervening technology, such as writing, meaning that writing is itself a technology a representation of language, and it is this technology that these models are built, are built on? Yes. Um, so writing itself is a discretization of language, um, and I think that is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, there's a kind of definition of technology that like it's everything that has been developed since you've been born. Um, <laughs> but everything prior to that is like things that you just naturalize and you don't think about as a technology, but writing is absolutely a technology. It was invented um, multiple times and um, because of its utility. And uh, so that, um, and it certainly, I mean, it doesn't, writing does not capture a whole bunch of things, right? Which is intonation and um, affect and, um, you know, lots of things, right? So, so you can see when it turns um, communication into um, writing, uh, when writing does that, that um, translation, then it's like it's throwing out a whole bunch of information. I think about that too, like with um, um, print, um, right? Which um, I feel like I'm gesturing to my colleagues who are here who know this much better than I do. But, you know, like Emily Dickinson, like you look at her hand-drawn poems and there's a lot of information there. That gets thrown out in the printing process because it's standardized. Um, and so the length of her dashes and you know things like that. Um, so that's another technology that has homogenized writing in certain ways. Um, and so you know, are we moving towards that and um and these kinds of language models, like possibly certainly it's useful. This is one reason why I like to think historically, is that um there's models earlier, there, there's some parallels, and then they're like there's always different. Right, we can't say, oh, it's just like when the printing press, you know, here there's a lot of conversations about language models being like, oh, it's just like the calculator. So, like, just as the calculator changed the way we teach math, these systems, large language models, will change the way we teach writing. And, like, there's some parallels, um, but there's some differences too. So, paying attention to the, the different ways that these technologies operate, are disseminated, are taken up um, socially, things like that is really important. Um, so how do training data sets that are used in LNMS are in languages other than the English? How good are its predictions in languages other than English? If some languages have limited visibility online, how does the that impact LLMS perform in those languages and its ability to generate text from mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. This is a question about um how 
in languages, um, like if there's uh, smaller data sets for other languages, so le lesser represented languages in, in the data set, then like how good are their predictions of language? Um, so I um, don't speak another language well enough to test it myself, but I um, have had some really good conversations with a number of um, colleagues and writers um, in different languages, and they say that like actually it's pretty good um, in Korean, Norwegian, Spanish. Chinese, um, a few different um, languages that are represented in the in the data set. But um, what's interesting is that um, um, there's some conversations about like it's still embedding. I had a great conversation at a, a, con a conference in Norway in February uh, called Writing Research Across Borders, which is an international writing conference. Um, and we had kind of a, just a big conversation about this. Um, and so there were some um, Israeli writing researchers there and they said, you know, well, this is it's really funny because what it does is like the language is pretty good. Um, so like grammatically, structurally, it's all fine. But then they said, you know, they put it in, you know, some sort of, um, you know, write a letter or whatever. And they said, you know, it ends with a have a nice day exclamation point. And they just laughed because this is like so culturally inappropriate. You know, it's like clearly using a kind of North American model of how you write a business letter and embedding it in correct language. So grammatically, it's fine. But all the cultural kinds of things are are clearly still in translation, um, and so like the Norwegian um, writing researchers too, they were like, actually the Norwegian is pretty good, which you know, given that there's like five million Norwegian speakers and it's not well represented on the web, um, is like actually that's pretty good. Um, very small aspect of, of the data set and um, in GPT, but um, but they said you can you still get a sense that it's being translated from English, um, and they couldn't put their finger on why they thought that, but that um, but there was still a sense of that translation. Um, so I suspect that those things are getting better. Um, you know, one of the things OpenAI says is that they're working directly with the Icelandic government um, to preserve their language, um, because Icelandic is, you know, has a, a very strong orientation to preservation, but a very, um, very small speaking um, population. And so they're kind of hedging you know, their bets a little bit and like preserving the reproduction of Icelandic in these models um, and helping to, you know, so, so one of the things you can do, um, you have this, like, you can have this big, like kind of un-tagged um, data set and throw a bunch of stuff in there and let machine learning take care of it. Or you can take um, a data set that's smaller and have it kind of um, tagged and um, annotated by humans. And so that's like what they're doing since the Icelandic data set is much smaller. They're having actual Icelandic speakers tag it and say, you know, this is grammatical. This is this is the kind of human feedback stuff. So then it, the model can improve much faster, even though the data set is smaller because of those kind of iterative feedback loops. Maybe one more. Are any of these AIs changing their minds? If people ask the same question, will they always the same answer? Could not the models use their human interactions to be better? Yes. So I first of all, I would push back on that. Are any AIs changing their minds? They do not have a mind. Um, and that's kind of the whole thing. Um, do they provide different feedback and different answers? Yes. Um, so they are, um, you know, it's running the algorithm each time you run. But, you know, again, some of them are deterministic. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, but the GBTs are the, the ones that we have access to are not deterministic. So you ask it something and then it can provide a different answer. Um, now, if you're thinking about like the guardrails or, you know, like if you can kind of get around, like it thinks that you can't, that it can't answer this question, but maybe if you ask it in a different way, it will answer that question. Like that's absolutely possible. Um, and you can, but, you know, as they get, figure out more and more guardrails um, and, and operate against that, then, um, it's harder and harder to do, but there's still a lot of ways to, to do that. Right. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.